Okay, so we are in episode 13 on page 38. We left episode 12. Beowulf had ripped off Grendel's arm and he had hung it um, on the wall um, from his about his shoulder uh, down. So, 38. And then in the morning, crowds surrounded Herod, warriors coming to the hall from faraway lands, princes and leaders of men hurrying to behold the monster's great staggering tracks. They gaped with no sense of sorrow, felt no regret for his suffering, went tracing his bloody footprints, his beaten and lonely flight to the edge of the lake where he dragged his corpse-like way, doomed and already weary of his vanishing life. The water was bloody, steaming and boiling in horrible pounding waves, heat sucked from his magic veins. But the swirling surf had covered his death, hidden deep in murky darkness, his visible end, as hell opened to receive him. So it's the morning after. Um, there's this giant celebration. The narrator comments that no one really felt bad. No one had sorrow or felt regret for his suffering as the Geats and Danes um, take joy in his death. Um, the people then follow the, his bloody footprints back to the lake, and his lair is actually underneath the lake, which is a little strange because they said originally in the beginning that the lair was um, in the moors, but it's actually in the moors underneath the swamp. Um, you have to determine kind of what's the poet's purpose or why does the poet or the translator shift um, his location of his home. We have to remember that this is translation, translation, translation later and um, parts of the episodes get skewed. Um, so one individual who translates the story may think that he lives in the moors where another individual thinks he lives underneath the moors. Okay, um, There's this this horrible imagery of the water bloody and steaming and boiling because of his poisonous blood going out into the ocean, into the water. Then old and young rejoiced, turned back from that heavy pil happy pilgrimage, mounted their hard hooked horses, high spirited stallions, and rolled them slowly toward Herod again, retelling Beowulf's bravery as they jogged along. And over and over they swore that nowhere on earth or under the spreading sky or between the seas, neither south nor north, was there a warrior worthier to rule over men? So everyone is really spreading the story of Beowulf and Grendel, and there's actually messengers that are sent out on missions to share the story of the battle. This is their way of communicating. Um, and it's during these missions on the soldiers' rides that they begin to compare, like a simile, like an epic simile, the story of Beowulf to other famous leaders. But no one meant Beowulf's praise to belittle Hrothgar, their kind and gracious king. So even though they're going to tell these stories now in this episode about wonderful leaders and they believe that Beowulf is a, is a leader among all the men there, the poet makes sure that we know that Hrothgar really is the, the sole responsible person for bringing Beowulf here. So he, above all, is the best leader. And sometimes when the path ran straight and clear, they would let their horses race, red and brown and pale yellow backs streaming down the road. And sometimes a proud old soldier who had heard songs of the ancient heroes and could sing them all through, story after story, would weave a net of words for Beowulf's victory, tying the knot of his verses smoothly, swiftly into place with a poet's quick skill, singing his new song aloud while he, while he shaped it, and the old songs as well. Sigmund's Adventures Familiar battles fought by the glorious son of Bales, and struggles too against evil and treachery that no one had ever heard of, that no one knew except Fitla, who had fought at his uncle's side, a brave young comrade, carefully listening when Sigmund's tongue unwound the wonders he had worked, confiding in his closest friend. There were tales of giants wiped from the earth by Sigmund's might, and forever remembered, fame that would last beyond life and death, his daring battle with a treasure-rich dragon. So, we now hear the story of Sigmund. We also know that Sigmund has a nephew, nephew named Fitla. Okay? Sigmund was an unbelievable leader and warrior. So much so that he's remembered far after his death. This is evidence of the theme of courage and bravery. A warrior's main purpose was, not, was, was to be great when he was on earth, but a true sign of someone's bravery was that they were remembered after death. So Sigmund is one of those people. Sigmund is a parallel to Beowulf. Okay, They're comparing, through an epic simile, one of your characteristic in conventions, the story of Sigmund to the story of Beowulf. 
So we're going to learn a little bit more about Sigmund. He um, fought descendants of Cain, specifically a dragon. Heaving a hoary gray rock aside, Sigmund had gone down to the dragon alone, entered the hole where it hid and swung his sword so savagely that it slipped the tree creature through, pierced its flesh, and pinned it to a wall, hung it where his bright blade rested. So Sigmund actually cut the dragon in half and pinned it to the wall. Okay? Obviously, um, supernatural or unhuman um, heroic powers. His courage and strength had earned him a king-like treasure, brought gold and rich rings to his glorious hands. That line specifically is um, examples of the theme of wealth. He loaded that precious hoard on his ship and sailed off with a shining cargo. And the dragon dissolved in his own fierce blood. So we have the story of Sigmund, the, him defeating the descendant of Cain, which was a dragon, him then being handsomely rewarded, filling up his ship, returning to his people, and spreading the wealth to his people. All signs of a great leader. All signs that run parallel to who Hrothgar is and now who Beowulf is. No prince, no protector of his warriors, knew power and fame and glory like Sigmund's. His name and his treasures grew great. Hermann could have hoped for at least as much. So now we see someone, we see a leader who represents everything that the warrior culture respects. A leader who's a good warrior, fights evil, rewards his people, treats them kindly. Now what we're going to see is we're going to see a story about this guy named Hermod, who was a horrible leader. Okay? Hermod is the foil to Sigmund. Hermod is the foil to Hrothgar. And Hermod is everything that Beowulf should not become. So here's the story of Hermod. Hermod could have hoped for at least as much. He was once the mightiest of men, but pride and defeat and betrayal sent him into exile with the Jutes, and he ended his life on their swords. That life had been misery after misery, and he spread sorrow as long as he lived it, heaped troubles on his unhappy people's heads, ignored all wise men's warnings, ruled only with courage. So Hermod had brought misery to his people, had not listened to his elders, and because of that, although he was strong and brave, he was seen as a horrible leader. A king born, so he was part of his lineage, one another characteristics and convention, he was um, destined to be king. And trusted with ancient treasures and cities full of strong-hearted soldiers, his vanity swelled him so vile in rank that he could hear no voices but his own. So he had a, he had a king, he had a kingship, he had the title, he had the wealth, he had soldiers that would die for him, but because of his vanity, because he believed that he, his main concern was his own success and his own well-being, um, he was doomed. He deserved to suffer and die. But Beowulf was a prince well-loved, followed in friendship, not in fear. Hermod's heart had been hollowed by sin. So right there is a complete contrast between who Beowulf is and who Hermod is. The horses ran when they could on the gravel path. Morning slid past and was gone. The whole brave company came riding to Herod, anxious to celebrate Beowulf's success and stare at that arm. And Hrothgar rose from beside his wife and came with his courtiers crowded around him. And Welthar rose and joined him, his wife and queen with her women, all of them walking to that wonderful hall. So, what's the most important part of episode 13 is not is the fact that what the poet is doing is he's telling us these are the people that need to be king, that are good kings, Her Hrothgar and Sigmund. Then we have Hermod. He is the foil. He is the antithesis of everything that is good about the warrior culture. Beowulf has a choice. He could be like Hrothgar and Sigmund, or he could turn out and be like Hermod. So what the poet is doing is he's telling both sides of the story, another characteristics and conventions of an, of an epic. Beowulf has the ability to go to either side. It's now what Beowulf takes with him that will shape his identity.